Thank you for joining me once again where people continue to be wrong on the interwebs, I surmise. Caveat, I have not watched this video through. I do not know what's going to be said, although I have a fair idea. This will be an off-the-cuff reaction in my usual style. This is the interminably, um, invariably erroneous Gil Carvalho. Uh, this video, he has a guest called Dr. Mackey or Markey, whatever it is. And they want to talk about seed oils and cardiovascular disease risk. So you can see where this one's going already before we even watch it, can't you, boys and girls? Anyway, let's deal with it in our usual fashion. Off you go, Gil. After our video on seed oils and inflammation, a lot of viewers have asked about cardiovascular disease. Do seed oils and omega-6s affect heart disease and cardiovascular disease? Well, effect is the conjugate of cause. You would need a cause and effect experiment on human beings conducted over multiple decades under metabolic ward lock and control and observation with an appropriately um, selected, randomized group of individuals who were genetically identical on each side of the equation for any factor being looked at. No such studies exist. So we're done. Thanks for joining me. Join me next time when someone else will make erroneous conclusions about what they think science says when it doesn't. Oh, all right, we'll hear him out. Off you go. So I recently sat down with Dr. Kevin Mackey. Kevin is the current president of the American National Lipid Association and the founder of MB Clinical Research and Consulting. He's published hundreds of studies and book chapters on lipid biology, including work on omega-6s, saturated fat, and cardiovascular disease. Good for him. So I figured no better person to address these questions with. My well, actually, there probably is a number of better people to address this question with, Gil, because um, I suspect that Dr. Mackey is going to get several things about the core basic tenets of science badly wrong. Because anytime you want to start talking about cause and effect or risk, which is a cause and effect statement, you need to be able to provide a cause and effect experimental piece of work to underpin that claim and you won't be able to do it. So there's a preempting of this video before it even gets rolling. Off you go there. My goal is always to bring the top science and the top scientists on the planet. Well, fail then. Straight to your electronic device. So I'm really excited to release this series of videos with Dr. Mackey. It's not just the nuggets of knowledge he shares with us. It's also getting to see how a professional scientist thinks and talks. Well, Many different professional scientists think and talk very differently from one another. There is no one methodology. There is, however, one scientific discipline which we're all expected to adhere to. The problem is the vast majority of people working in science fail to do so at some point or another, to some degree or another, because human beings are fallible and fail to show the appropriate disciplines often. As he answers my questions, try to notice how every statement is rooted in evidence. Oh, really? Well, that'll be interesting to see. How cautious he is, how he qualifies everything, how he acknowledges areas of uncertainty. We live in an age of influencers yelling at you about poison and toxins and superfoods with absolute unshakable confidence and no evidence. Yes. So I think platforming more scientists is exactly what we need. Enjoy. As you might know, there's a lot of questions, a lot of curiosity by the public on the internet about omega-6s and omega-6 rich oils and all these things. And people are getting all kinds of different messages from different sources on the internet. So uh, it'd be great if you could give a slightly uh, summarized version uh, of that kind of the overview of the field. What is the evidence? And specifically with, with regards to cardiovascular disease, what do we know in terms of the effect of omega-6s or omega-6 rich oils on cardiovascular disease? And Nothing whatsoever, as I've covered. Effect is the conjugate of cause, cause and effect. We know nothing about that. Kind of the, the main lines of evidence. Sure thing. Well, there are two main lines of evidence, observational evidence and then randomized controlled trials. No, there aren't randomized controlled trials at all, in fact. The word that you're misusing there, the discipline has gone out the window straight away, Dr. Mackey, is controlled, or indeed randomized often as well. 
Okay, mostly controlled or somewhat controlled is not controlled. Sorry about that. And for randomized controlled trials, unfortunately, we don't have any at all whatsoever modern large scale outcomes trials for the most part. We do, for we don't at all, in fact, for a few things like a Mediterranean dietary pattern. No, we don't. No, that is false. But most of the randomized controlled trials that looked at actual outcomes like heart attacks and strokes and death were completed decades ago. And very poorly. And so they're difficult to interpret. So Well, impossible to get any value from, in fact. So this is a guy that's been lauded for his evidence base, so-called, and his caution. And the first three or four or five sentences out of this man's mouth are complete nonsense. Gil, son, hello. So from the observational evidence, what we generally see is that a diet higher in unsaturated fatty acids. No, we don't see anything of the sort. There are no studies that look at what people genuinely did eat. In order to do that, you have to keep them under lock and key and observation 24-7. You cannot do it with a respondent data questionnaire. They are inaccurate. We are done. Acids, and that would be either omega-6 polyunsaturated fatty acids or omega-9 monounsaturated fatty acids, is associated with lower risk for cardiovascular. No. Risk is the word you've used inappropriately there. Risk is a cause and effect statement. This is not an experiment. False. We are done here. Killer disease events. And uh, saturated fatty acid intake uh, is associated with higher risk, but you always... No, it isn't. That is false. Demonstrably false. I would happily debate this Dr. Mackey any day of the week and twice on Sundays on the empirical evidence that he claims supports the posit that he's just offered, because it is false. I am, among other things, an expert in pure and applied statistics and statistical inference, so that'll be an interesting chat, among other things. False, Dr. Mackey, absolutely false. Have to ask the question in nutrition, compared to what? And so, it, no, you don't. What you have to understand is that no associative study of any kind can inform on cause and effect whatsoever. You have to understand that. You have to apply that discipline whether or not you like it. It does depend on what you compare it to with, when you compare saturated fatty acid intake. To no, again, you're relying on respondent data feedback, which is vastly inaccurate, demonstrably so. Total invalidation of all of these so-called associative studies, which, even if they were accurate, cannot inform on cause and effect. This is what you need to be saying. You are failing utterly to apply scientific discipline, Dr. Mackey. The trans fats, trans fats are worse. When you compare saturated fatty acid intake to unsaturated fats, Saturated fats. But nobody's done that, though. There are no experiments comparing those things. I've already covered that in more than enough detail already. You're making shit up. That is not what a scientist does. Worse. When you compare saturated fats to carbohydrates from... Again, that hasn't been done either. Starches, refined starches and added sugars, they're roughly neutral. And when you compare saturated fatty acid intake... Hasn't been done, whatever you're going to say next. There have been no peer-wise comparisons between any form of fat and any other form of fat or any other form of food either at all. Not one. Goodness sake, this isn't hard to understand. To intake of carbohydrates from whole grains, the saturated fatty acids look worse. No, they don't. False. So, you know, the uh, question is always compared to what? No, it isn't. That's not always what the question is. And then we also have randomized controlled trials. No, you don't. Still, 
to look at the effects of different fatty acids. No, you don't still on biomarkers of disease risk. Well, that's not a hard health outcome. That's not valid. It's not of any interest to us. We're interested in hard health outcomes. Show me some of those. And so one of the main biomarkers that we look at is LDL cholesterol. Well, there you go. That's why we're not interested in your biomarkers, because that's totally invalid as a marker of disease incidence, let alone risk. They are not causally related at all. Really, Gil, this is the best you could come up with, this clown? It just goes to show you that even someone with, a, with so-called hundreds of peer-reviewed publications isn't necessarily worth listening to or robust or sensible or scientific. This guy is a buffoon. No idea at all. No discipline whatsoever. Not a scientist. Just because he's doing some scientific research and getting it published, that doesn't actually make you a scientist. A scientist is disciplined and follows the rules. This guy doesn't even know what the rules are. Well, LDL cholesterol is a surrogate marker, really, for atherogenic lipoproteins. No, it isn't. And there are no such thing as atherogenic lipoproteins. They don't exist. That's a construct, a false construct. It's erroneous from the ground up. One of my other areas of expertise, in case you don't know, is cardiovascular pathophysiology, Dr. Mecca. Okay? And a better... Mackey. My bad. ...marker is apolipoprotein B. No, it isn't. It's a slightly more... Um, it's a slightly closer predictive thing in terms of... Well, it's not even predictive. It's associative. But that doesn't mean that it's causal either. It still isn't. So wrong again. Because every potentially atherogenic... There are no atherogenic lipoproteins. Lipoprotein particle has one molecule of ApoB. So that's LDL particles, VLDL particles, chylomicron remnant particles, and then IDL or intermediate density lipoprotein particles and LP little a particles. So all the bad guys have one molecule of ApoB. They're not bad guys. That's ridiculous, fundamentally, utterly ridiculous. Every one of those lipoproteins exists because it has a role to play in the human metabolic system. Each one is encoded for by DNA that stipulates that it should be made. Bad guy. Why would we make things that will kill us? This is just beyond a joke. This is ridiculous. So I like to look at that, but we don't really measure that clinically in the U.S., and so we use LDL cholesterol as an imperfect indicator. Well, it's no indicator at all. Absolutely no indicator whatsoever of any one given individual's likelihood of anything, ever. And so what we see is if you feed people saturated fatty acids, LDL cholesterol goes up. Yes, as it should. If you feed them monounsaturated... By the way, LDL cholesterol does not exist. LDL and cholesterol, while ever they tend to travel around together, are not the same thing. LDL is not cholesterol, and cholesterol is not LDL. Cholesterol is the lipid, and LDL is the transporter for that lipid, as is HDL and all the other lipoproteins that carry lipids around in the blood, for example. Okay? Goodness sake. Treated fatty acids, LDL cholesterol goes down a little bit. So? Compared to carbohydrates or saturated fats. So? And, and if you feed them polyunsaturated fatty acids, omega-6, LDL cholesterol goes down more. So, so? That's probably a bad thing, if anything, in fact. Just to put that into perspective, compared to usual diet, in a controlled feeding study that we did, where we gave everybody all of their food during the study period. Uh, did you actually keep them under lock and key and make sure that they complied entirely? No? Whoops. Uh, we found that extra virgin olive oil, which is rich in MUFAs. Model. And how long was your study period? What was your sample size? Did you have statistical power? Unsaturated fatty acids lowered 
LDL cholesterol by about three and a half percent. So what? That's probably a bad thing, if anything. And corn oil, which is rich in omega-6 linoleic acid, lowered LDL cholesterol by about 11 percent. That's definitely a bad thing. So uh, LDL cholesterol is a biomarker that we use to estimate risk. It's only... Well, that's, that's a falsehood. That's a fallacy. That's a mistake. You cannot estimate or even gauge in any way any one given individual person's risk of anything using any of the lipoproteins as a, gu as a guide. That will not work. There is no causal artifact there. None at all. Only one factor, but uh, as far as lipoprotein levels go, as far as the observational evidence goes. What observational evidence of what? And as far as the limited evidence we have from large-scale randomized controlled outcomes trials go... None. Be honest. None is none. You have no evidence from randomized controlled trials. None at all. The real winners are unsaturated fatty acids. False. Lowering your cholesterol is not indicated. It is not a good idea. You should not attempt to do so. And that's both mono and polyunsaturated. They are both pro inflammatory, in fact, and are, as such, contraindicated more likely than not. Fatty acids. In our study that I mentioned, where we fed people, uh, the lipid levels look better with corn oil. What, what is a better lipid level? You think high LDL is contraindicated as a bad thing, and lower is better. You are wrong in that. We're done. But blood pressure and heart rate went down with extra virgin olive oil. So, what's that got to do with the price of fish in China in 1965? So, you know, I'm a fan of saying that in general, in the US, we eat more saturated fat than uh, is optimal. No, that's false. Less than what is optimal is, in fact, what's going on for most. And uh, we should be striving to replace some of that saturated fat with unsaturated fats. Why? For what reason? You haven't provided any reason that's valid whatsoever. It's contraindicated, in fact. More likely than not. That would be both linoleic acid or omega-6 and things like canola oil, uh, avocado oil, olive oil that are rich in monounsaturated fatty acids. Pro-inflammatory, all of it. Not a good thing. Mm. One thing that people ask when it comes to observational data, there's a couple of caveats, and one of them is the reliance on self-report. That there can be error, there can be uh, people may not be completely uh, forthright, or they or they may not remember things of this nature. Mm -hmm. uh, to some extent, with omega sixes and with linoleic acid in particular, uh, there is, I understand, a, a sort of a way around it by measuring serum markers. To what, to what extent is that a reliable measure of intake? And to what extent is that, what has that, that taught us? Uh, well, it's still all pointless, isn't it? Because you are not getting at hard health outcomes, cause and effect. You cannot, therefore, assert anything about hard health outcomes, cause and effect. This is all an area of ideology, not science. We're done here. Goodness sake. In terms of also cardiovascular outcomes. When it comes to biomarkers, <clears throat> there are certain fatty acids for which biomarkers can be very valuable. So like omega-3 fatty acid intake, when you look at things like red blood cell membranes, when you look at plasma phospholipids, even total plasma levels, they... Uh, really vary a lot, specifically EPA, icosa pentanoic acid, and DHA, docosa hexanoic acid. Dietary variation produces variation in these biomarkers. So it works really well for that. Works pretty well for linoleic acid as well, uh, again, a, an omega-6 PUFA. Uh, for other fatty acids, not as well, because as an example, when humans convert carbohydrate into fat, they mainly produce palmitic acid. So the palmitic acid level in the blood reflects partly what's in the diet and partly how much de novo lipogenesis is going on. 
Uh, so you have some similar similar problems with the monounsaturated fatty acids. So again, it depends on what you're looking at, but you do get around this issue specifically with linoleic acid and EPA and DHA of uncertainty because dietary measurements are very crude. You know, if I ask you over the last three months, how many times did you eat this? You know, you're going to give an estimate, but who knows how accurate it is? Well, very, very grossly, vastly, hugely inaccurate is the usual answer. And so for huge groups of people, it works reasonably well. For smaller groups, there's a lot of imprecision. And so biomarkers are very helpful because they can help us quantify the exposure to these levels of fatty acids. And then there are genetic variants that also influence. The See, all of this is just waffle. None of it deals with the fact still that we have no evidence whatsoever cause and effect linking any fatty acid of any kind with any hard health outcome in human beings of any kind over any period of time. None at all. That is where we should be focused. That is where the discipline of a scientist is. That is what we have to be honest with the general public about. The biomarker levels and so forth. So, you know, they're not perfect tools, but they are very helpful. And for the most part, when it comes to the omega-6 polyunsaturated fatty acids, the biomarker results really align very well with the results from uh, dietary estimation. So what? And so they tell a pretty consistent story. Lower risk of cardiovascular. No, they do not inform on risk whatsoever. Risk is a cause and effect statement. It implies that if I change my behavior with regard to the intake of a certain fatty acid, for example, that will have an effect on my individual likelihood going forward of experiencing a certain hard health outcome or not. There is no evidence to support such a claim. It does not exist. Vascular disease associated with higher intake of omega-6 and omega-3 polyunsaturated fatty acids. My conclusion is that the bulk of the evidence, which has limitations. Yes. In other words, is therefore not submissible as evidence for anything. Supports the idea that we should be consuming more unsaturated fatty acids. Okay, well, your conclusion is vastly, vastly erroneous. It is not underpinned by any actual science or discipline of science. It is an ideology. It is your opinion based on your lack of discipline as a scientist. You ought to be ashamed of yourself. This is absolutely appalling. Dr. Mackey, appalling acids and try and replace saturated fatty acids with unsaturated fatty acids. You should do no such thing, in fact. Uh, from both omega-6 PUFAs and omega-9 MUFAs. No, you should do no such thing. And, you know, what about omega-3s? Are you leaving those out for a reason or? Not leaving them out for a reason. I think that we have some pretty good evidence. Oh, here we go again. Do you? Of what? Now, and it comes from a number of sources, that EPA in particular is helpful. For what? When it comes to cardiovascular disease risk. No. See, there you go again. No. There are no studies that inform us on cardiovascular risk. They do not exist. Still, we have three studies. No, no, you don't. None of them are perfect. None of them can inform on cause and effect. They do not exist. Uh, but we have the Reduce trial, we have the Jealous trial, and then we recently just saw results from Respect EPA, another study done in Japan like Jealous. And all three of them have essentially shown the same thing reduce cardiovascular disease event risk. No, not risk. They didn't look at risk. They looked at and hopefully accurately reported incidence retrospectively in a group of people.
That's not risk. That's the incidents in that group of people at that time under the circumstances that those people lived with no control. That is not science. And you, sir, are a joke. A ridiculous joke. What's next? When EPA is given, and it has to be at a decent dose to the trial. What is a decent dose? Use 1.8 grams a day. One use. Also, is it a good idea to give someone supplemental omega-3 oil? Perhaps you should look at a pilot study done by a very intelligent and very attractive young scientist called Johnson not that many moons ago, and some other clown she was working with on that study. It's in the journal Nutrients. Or Nutrition, or something. I can't remember. I'll put the link on the screen so you can find it easily. Sure, it's a pilot study, but it does show pretty good reason to think very, very seriously about whether or not giving someone supplemental omega-3 oil is a good idea or whether it's likely to be a very bad idea. Check it out. What's next? Four grams a day. Mm. And all three of them showed basically concordant results, sort of 20 to 25% reduction in cardiovascular disease events. Respect EPA for the... Yeah, and did, did you adjust those statistics at all from what was actually observed, in which case... It belongs in the fiction section, doesn't it? Because you cannot adjust incidents from what it actually was and what it was observed to be to something different by using a multiple regression sum. That's not science either. Did you do that? Bet you did. The primary outcome had a p-value of 0.055. So what? What was its clinical utility? No? Shall we wait for that? We'll be waiting all day. So, you know, taken in, in conjunction with Jealous, I think two trials in Japan with essentially the same intervention have shown benefit. No. Benefit is also a cause and effect statement. You haven't shown that at all with any of those studies. False. Incompetent reading of, this, of the so-called science. It's not science. Not science at all. Science is interventional. And it's conducted according to disciplines, which epidemiology completely ignores. And up to and including reporting what you actually observed, as I've just covered. All right, we're done with that. What's next? And then in the reduce it trial, which was four grams a day of EPA, or very close to four grams a day, about 3.8 grams, that trial showed about a 25% reduction in the primary outcome, which was cardiovascular disease events. The one fly in the ointment there is that the placebo that was used was mineral oil. And we have some evidence that mineral oil makes some cardiovascular risk factors. No, not risk factors. Risk is a conjugate of cause. It requires experimental underpinning. None exists. No. Discipline. Discipline. Worse. And so what I would say is it is possible that some portion of that 25% was due to the adverse effects of the mineral oil. So speculation. Good. On outcomes. Very scientific. Very speculative. Good. But when you... It, let's, let's attribute 5% to that. that. Why? On what basis? Jesus, Gil Carvalho, you told us at the beginning of this video that this guy was cautious and evidence-based. Now he's pulling numbers out of his sphincter. What is wrong with you? That means we have three trials that have all shown roughly 20% risk reduction. No, not risk. Risk is a cause and effect statement, still. An EPA intervention. One of the things that taking EPA does is it suppresses blood levels of arachidonic acid. So one possible contributing... Oh, so mechanistic speculation. Good. Very scientific. Mechanism is not only the benefits of EPA, but 
the benefit that may result from reducing blood levels. What about the risks of EPA? The very serious risks of EPA. Have you accounted for those? Of arachidonic acid. There are a couple of common questions in this area that people ask when they hear this idea that unsaturated fats are more health promoting or more cardioprotective. Well, neither of those things are supported by evidence anywhere. They are both speculations, they're both ideologies. Uh, The main one is probably regarding a a couple of specific randomized control trials from the 60s and 70s. There aren't any, still. Minnesota and Sydney, this is probably question number one. Um, What do we know about these trials? And uh, yeah, are there caveats? Are they, how reliable are they? What what do they teach us? Well, I think a lot of caveats and, you know, kudos to uh, Chris Ramsden and Joe Hiblin for, going back and unearthing more information about these trials so that they could really be considered. But there's only so much you can do when a trial was conducted decades ago and you're sort of forensically trying to reconstruct what was done. Also, the outcome uh, that was really focused on was cardiovascular mortality as well as total mortality. And, you know, that's a complicated outcome. Yes. So some of cardiovascular mortality is due to events, um, heart attacks, and some is due to uh, heart attacks and strokes on the one hand. Some is due to arrhythmias. Um, Sometimes it's difficult to classify. So in modern trials, if you look at all of the myocardial infarctions that are submitted to adjudication committees, very often 20% of them are rejected and the conclusion of the committee that's reviewing it is we can't tell for sure that this is a myocardial infarction. So I think that why bo- I mean, well, all of that is true, but why bother with that? Because we have not undertaken an interventional experimental study under lock and key observation in a large number of hitherto genetically identical research twins over multiple decades to even get anywhere near looking at cause and effect. We are done here. That looking at trials from decades ago is problematic, both in terms of assessing the outcomes. And you think that more recent studies are any better? If so, why would you, what would you base that belief structure on? They are no better. They suffer from exactly the same totally invalidating flaws. My word, this is beyond a joke. And also because people were very different then, uh, much higher prevalence of smoking. And years ago, the diet was very different. It was very common to have something like 16% of your calories from saturated fatty acids uh, back then as compared to about 11% today. So, yeah, and look how much that's improved the cardiovascular health of our population since the 60s. Whoops. Hmm. People were different in many respects, lifestyle-wise and in their characteristics, and the assessment of outcomes was different than it would be in a modern trial. So, uh, And there are still no trials proposed or possible in modern society where we can adequately observe and control to call it a scientific study that can remotely inform us on cause and effect or even relatively well imply such a thing. This is impossible. Still. I think they tell us some things, but we have to be very careful about over interpreting them. Well, that comes from a bloke who thinks that we can talk about cause and effect from prospective cohort studies and risk from prospective cohort studies. We can't. This is a bloke who thinks adjusted outcome statistics are perfectly valid. They're not. Goodness gracious. This is a bloke who thinks just putting the word randomized and controlled in front of a trial makes it so. Read the goddamned methodology they used. 
that was neither randomized appropriately or adequately nor controlled. Wow. And so what I'll say is that for those studies, um, the conclusion was essentially that the studies uh, did not support a benefit of replacing saturated fatty acids with unsaturated fatty acids. What a shock. Acids, with a couple of caveats. One issue that's been raised is the possibility that the unsaturated fatty acids came along with some trans fatty acids. And yes, yeah, speculation. Good. Very scientific. We can't tell. I mean, you know, you can't go back decades and say, well, we're going to go to the storage unit and uh, take some of the, you know, intervention foods and test them. So all you can do is look at the records and try and assess whether that was true. I think it's uncertain. And so I view those in the same way I view a lot of observational evidence. Uh, re Why would you call it evidence? It's not evidence. Reasonable for hypothesis generation, and we really need to test these ideas. Ah, so you do understand this. Why then have you been talking about risk from observational so-called associative studies that report adjusted outcomes? Please explain. We'll wait. We really won't in large-scale randomized controlled outcomes trials. There aren't any. And I'm sad to say that, you know, Spain is way ahead of us in funding those. It's kind of an embarrassment that the United States has not funded these trials, even though every five years we update our dietary recommendations. We, by publishing the same ones again. We don't follow that up with large-scale trials to test them. One, one specific argument or question I've heard regarding Sydney is that uh, the, the this likelihood of the trans fats is not very believable because the, the level of total cholesterol, serum cholesterol, or LDL cholesterol, I forget which one they measured, came down by 20 points or so. So what? And so the argument is that if if the if they were replacing, if the comparator were, were was trans fats, you would expect an increase in total cholesterol. To what extent is that a, a valid argument? That's nothing to do with anything. It's a complete waste of time. Yeah, well, you have these competing effects. So you have the influence of the unsaturated fatty acids, and even if some trans fatty acids came along with it, you've got unsaturated fatty acids lowering LDL cholesterol. So? Well, trans fatty acids would tend to have the opposite effect. So? And so the net would depend on the ratio of unsaturated to trans unsaturated fatty acids. So? Acids. And we're still just talking about lipoproteins, which bear no causal artifact with health outcomes of any kind. Thank you. So, you know, that does bolster the argument that it was mainly unsaturated PUFAs that were being given. But, you know, trans fats have um, a very strong and linear relationship to cardiovascular risk. No, it's not very strong. In fact, that is a value judgment statement. A scientist provides the actual outcome statistics for an inference he wants to make or she wants to make. That's what the discipline requires you to do, not to give us a value judgment statement or an opinion. That's probably partly mediated through effects on lipids, but partly mediated through other effects. So, you know, again, it it is just another one of the question marks we have about these trials and why they're not trials they are not adequately randomized controlled observed they are a failure they are the closest we can approximate experimenting on human beings that doesn't make them valid correct or robust they are none of those things they are also totally lacking in tenure. Heart disease develops over decades, not over a couple of weeks in some trial or another. Okay? I am hopeful that we'll see new trials undertaken, but uh, one thing that I think may help with that 
is that outcomes trials are very large and expensive, and they take a long time to generate enough events. But we now have imaging technologies where you can have much smaller studies and look at a much better surrogate marker than just lipid levels or blood pressure and what have you, and look at the actual progression of atherosclerosis. That would be sensible. And you can do that non-invasively now. Well, there's a fair amount of reds involved. So it's not truly non-invasive in a real sense. And with new uh, AI technologies, uh, we're getting much, much better at reading those and detecting small changes. So I'm hopeful that we'll have dietary intervention trials where, you know, they don't have to... Let you will still have to keep people under lock and key and observation in a locked laboratory for decades. You still won't be able to do that. Okay? Last for 10 years. They can last for a couple of years of follow-up, and we'll have very reliable evidence about... No, because you haven't observed and controlled those people. You do not know what they did. You left them to go and live under their own recognizance. Goodness gracious. This isn't rocket science. A progression of atherosclerosis, which doesn't tell the full story, but it certainly tells a big portion of the story. So I'm optimistic we'll have that. It's not going to be in the next couple of years, but hopefully before I die of natural causes. <laughs> uh, hopefully uh, long before we are, we're all gone. We also discussed the effect of seed oils on inflammation, insulin resistance, body weight, the omega-3 to omega-6 ratio, and a lot of other topics. So stay tuned for those videos dropping as soon as we can finalize them. Thanks for watching. Yeah, on the basis of the quality of this little expedition, Gil, I think I'll pass, frankly. This bloke of yours who you deem to be a competent scientist, in my estimation, is anything but. Just because he's publishing and being successful in publishing doesn't make him actually competent to discuss science. He's shown clearly in this video that he's anything but. He's an audiologue, just like you are. He failed to apply scientific discipline. Not good enough. Right, the rest of you, you know the drill. Join me next time when someone else will be wrong on the interwebs, because there's a lot of it going on, isn't there? See you then.